Remember, I turn around as the sun's coming up. Behind us is a friggin' runway. There's like an airport. And there's like planes, like little planes landing and things. And then the police came, but there was too many people for them to stop it. I can remember the police, all they were concerned about was that people were dancing. They got over this fence and they were dancing on the runway, or near the runway. <laughs> there's like these little planes coming to You ever been to a rave on a runway? What the fuck? Yeah. Killer, killer, podcast. KillerKellerOfficial.com You need the Kellervision app. 24-7 mini documentaries, podcasts, live shows, DJ live streams, top fives, subscription packages, plus products for all your podcasts and street culture sports. Download it from the App Store for free today. Beatbox created. And we need to talk about world music and street culture. Killer Keller Podcast. We rolling? We are. We are rolling. I'm good. Thank you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it's Killer Keller Podcast, live and direct, central London, or central as you need to be. Hold tight on the television crew, download the app, you know it's free. Free value for all your freeness that you need in the street culture and more. Android and iPhone. Yeah, big shout out to graffitikings.co.uk. We've got a legend in the building, man. Switch on now. Click, click, boom. Yeah, Doc Scott inside the place, drum and bass, Metalhead's original. How are you? I'm good, man. I'm good. Thank you very much. How was that for an intro, eh? Professional. <laughs> Very professional. Slick. You know it's like, like you've done it before. Yeah, like like we've done it before. But you know when your hero so, uh, say, hey, that's really sick. You did really well there, mate. That's the guy right here. <laughs> Off the bat, I know we I know I said it privately, mm. but let's say it publicly. Apologies again for the strong arm. But <laughs> but it has but you know I, I'm a fan of the of the show, of the podcast, man, especially the graffiti ones, man. So just wanted to say it on record. Oh. It's uh it's a little bit surreal, actually, because I've heard your voice for the last eight months, <laughs> delving through the archives, you know, hey. lockdown yeah. being what it is, has allowed me to kind of go down rabbit holes that haven't gone down for a long time. So, um, yeah, I just thought, and then when you had Frost on, I was like, hang on a minute, man, this guy's really kind of operating yeah. in my this kind of... This is too close for me. Yeah, yeah so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, thank you, thank you for having me down, man. My brother, to hear you say that... I'm gushing now. I'm like, oh, yo, this is crazy. Because our whole idea of, you know what it's like. You do things, you're not going to stop. You keep doing them mm -hmm. until you hit certain markers. And sure. you never know when those markers are. You, you, I mean, just, in, just, go, just to reverse engineer a little bit on the strong arm bit. I have to big shout out Goldie, Drax, but <laughs> Jumper Jack Frost, um, Reese, um, Navigator as well. Wasn't Navigator, it? <laughs> yeah, hold tight, Navigator, oh, Navi. Uh, yeah, the man. Thing, the thing was, they, they all they all hit me up and were like, "Yo, you've got to get Doc on. You got to get the, Doc." The on. thing was, right? I thought, oh, because I know what people are like. Sometimes you ask someone to do something, and they're like, you know, you get fifty percent strike rate. So I thought, yeah. if I asked four, I think I asked five people, I did not expect them all to hit you up. Within like two hours, yeah, yeah, yeah. so then so when <laughs> so when you called, thing. I was like, I'm really sorry, man, because that must have came across like some kind of ambush or something. It's you know fucking I mean? awesome. It's exactly what. <laughs> but you said something really, really nice because I think you said um, that a couple of them said to you, "I can't believe that I was asking mm -hmm. them to ask you," and I'm like, "But totally, you know, totally." Everyone was just like gassed that you were asking them, and I was like, "Yeah, they are. They're as they're as excited as we are." Yeah. So, so it's it's a it's a beautiful thing when things are, like and you know, you have, that's what I'm saying. You have good people. This is a good thing. So it's all good. My God, I'm happy, thank you man. so much. Well, you know, and, and graffiti in the roots. Um, from what I can recall, uh, big shout out Goldie as well. Good, dear friend of yours. And yep. obviously, you know, through the, through the eras of blue note and record releasing and Birmingham metalheads. Um, you first came into contact with him when he signed your spray can art book in 87. Eight, yeah. I think it was 86. Because I was, um, yeah, through through the eighties, I was got into the whole hip hop thing in the early eighties. Yeah. You know, the DJing thing, graffiti, break dancing, I was not so good at. But the graffiti and um, DJing really kind of appealed to me. I saw, I remember seeing a clip of Grandmaster Flash on TV. I think when I was like thirteen or something, mm. fucking blew my mind. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Just when like reports were coming from New York in 82, 83, about this new movement. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I can remember seeing graffiti in the background, people breakdancing and Grandmaster Flash on, you know, turntables, mm -hmm. two turntables. And I was like, fucking, fuck what, this? what is this? This looks incredible. And then um, I think I 
the, one of the first records I ever bought was like Electro 2 Street Sounds. And, you know, and then the whole kind of B-Boy thing started coming across in the so early bad 80s. Bad Boy compilation, wow. Yeah, that was like the first record. My dad took me to, I think it was Revolver Records in Coventry as it was, and I think it was 12, and I bought Electro 2. And um, just studied it, do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Studied it and studied it. And I was kind of, I was into music from in the 70s. When I was a kid growing up, mm. I used to watch movies. And I was fascinated with the soundtracks. You know, I was like mm -hmm. thinking, you know, I was fascinated with the way music could make you feel emotional, make yeah. you feel angry, make you feel scared, mm -hmm. suspense, all that kind of thing. So I used to watch movies and just be fascinated with the soundtracks. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then my dad, um, my dad was born in Africa. So he used to listen to a lot of reggae. So my childhood was like listening to a lot of reggae, but he was also into kind of like weird music. Like he was really into Pink Floyd, Tangerine Dream, Jean-Michel Jarre, Ooh. anything kind of experimental. So all, up to the age of 10, that's what yeah. I can really remember was reggae and then just some psychedelic fucking crazy shit. Do you know what I mean? Mm. So I had that as, that was my blueprint. The kind of transient crazy sounds. Yeah, which is kind of like what d and is, man. Yeah. Especially the d and I'm kind of into. So, mm. and I was drawn to music anyway. And then I was like making mixtapes when I was like 12. I had a tw twin cassette. Yeah. Um, and that's literally how I used to make mixtapes, obviously, yeah, yeah, yeah. before I had decks. And then I saw Grandmaster Flash and I was like, wow, this is amazing. And got into the whole hip hop thing and then slowly but surely got into the, the graph thing and the bombing thing. And then by the time I was like 13, 14, my parents had just split up mm. around, I think, when I was about 12, 13. And that gave me the freedom to basically do what the fuck I wanted to do. Cool. Do you know what I mean? Was that like a kind of key to the city sort of thing? Well, yeah. And then also you kind of, you, you want to, I was also, I think, maybe looking for some, a way mm. out of just getting away from that mm. kind of trauma of, it was not, there was that period when I was like 12, 13, it wasn't good when I was at home. So I was looking to get out all the time yeah. anyway. Yeah, yeah. Do you know what I mean? And then I was hanging around with like-minded kids that were kind of into the whole hip hop thing. You know, mm. some people more into breakdancing, some people were more into, you know, doing, doing the music side of thing. And then mm. there were people that were getting cans of paint and, and fucking going tagging, going bombing and everything. Do you know what I mean? It's quite mad when you put that, when you lay it out like that, hip hop was like the ultimate uh, medicine for you because it had all the elements of attack, had all the elements yeah, of activity. I think just that whole thing, because I mean, we're yeah. all, all b-boys at the end of the day. Do you know what I mean? If we're, if we're of a certain age, yeah, we are. we're all, we're all b-boys, man. Do you mm. know what I mean? Like drum and bass is an extension of b-boyism. Mm. Do you know what I mean? And um, so, yeah, I got, I got in, I was... By the time I was like 14, 15, I was hardcore into really? bombing. That's all, that's all I was doing, man. I was mixing in a day. My dad made me a pair of turntables when I was from my 14th birthday. And um, so I was practice mixing all day. And at that time, I was kind of like buying early electro and early house music and early techno. That's kind of more what I drifted into. Yeah. And at night, I was just going out bombing, bombing all the time, bombing all the time. And then, you know, I knew, I knew of Goldie. Um, you know, Goldie was, I mean, because he was up the road for me, it, from Wolverhampton. Yeah. yeah. So and I first knew of him because he was in, um, I think it was, they were called the Wolverhampton B Boys or that's the Birmingham it. B Boys. But yeah, 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 yeah. That's and I saw dancers, him breakdancing yeah. at an all day, like, and, you know, obviously he's just larger than life character. Yeah, yeah. Flamboyancy. Like, and then obviously he went, to, he went to New York. And then when he came back with Brim and Bio and Volk and all those guys. That's where you met up with him. That's, the the first, that's when I first met him. Mm. You know, he did an exhibition in Birmingham and we all went over there and, so he signed my book, Spray Can Art Book, uh, Subway Art Book, sorry. And then, this is, I mean, this is so weird. And then, like, uh, you know, I think he went away again. Then the rave scene happened in the late 80s. Mm. I looked into DJing, started playing out in 89 and mm. 90, really kind of made a name for myself mm. in those early raves in 90 mm. in the Midlands. And then met, I started making music in 91. And that's when he came back to the UK. He, you know, he met Kemi. Kemi mm -hmm. and Storm talking yeah. to Rage. And I was going to Rage around that time, back in the 91, 92. We both got to know Groove. I got to know Groove through DJ and he was coming up. Groove Rider, that is, sorry. Hold tight, Groove Rider. The mighty Groove Rider. The mighty Groove Rider. And, uh, and then G got just sucked into the whole rave thing because he'd missed like the first couple of years because he was in New York. And 91, he was going out. Big shout out Fabio as well, I'm not going to come. Oh my God, my guy. The Godfathers. The Godfathers. The Godfathers. And the reason why I'm here DNA. as a DJ, and I, I don't say that lightly, you know, that's that's the gospel. I literally learn everything I know from watching those guys. Because, you know, when, you, when you're coming up, man, you identify with someone that you're thinking, they're doing it right. Mm. And that's what I 
they're the, they're the lessons I need to learn. I need to listen to what they're doing. They were very informative times, weren't they? I know we're going off subject. Mm. You want a second, but the, but one thing that I I take from a lot some of the guys that that hit me up, um, and you'll know who I'm gonna who I'm referring to when uh, when talking about this. But the stories of you as a DJ, that, um, some would say that you're their favourite DJ. You're the DJ's DJ, and that was contributive to the amount of time that as a youngster you'd be sitting on the record boxes of other DJs studying them. Yeah, I, to me, I mean, some people see DJing um, as just playing records. Yeah. Some people see DJing as a real art form. To me, it is. It's a real, it's a real craft, man. Mm. You know, you can really take people on a journey when you're playing a set mm. and you know my favorite DJs when I when I f first started going out I mean when I first went to raves in 1989 mm. I went to biology I went to sunrise mm. went <laughs> to energy and the first guys I heard was Frost, Carl Cox, Fabio and Groove Rider and they all blew my mind do you know what I mean I can remember coming back from one of those raves in 89 I was playing out around that time just playing small parties small mm. little illegal parties mostly in, in Coventry and in the West mm. Midlands. And I remember coming back from one party and I'd heard those four guys play and I took half the records out my mm. out my because I was like, that's all shit. <laughs> you know what I mean? But that was an education, do you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. But, but you're right. Yeah. And then luckily when, when those guys started coming up to the Midlands to play and I was playing this like, like kind of 1990 and I was like 19 at the time, mm. 18, 19. Mm. But yeah, I would, I would, I would sit, you know, on somebody's record box and just watch these guys play. Like when Derek May first came to the UK in 1990, I literally stood by the side of the decks for his entire every set, man. You know yes, I mean? Derek May is, and uh, there was a club, I forget the name of it, that uh, Goldie mentions actually, that you did. Derek May used to be pro very prominent at, and you used to go there very frequently, but I'm sure you were an avid follower of him were in any capacity. Yeah, I mean, Derek May was like a, Godlike to mm. me, do you know what I mean? Because I, I first started buying his records in like 86, 87 kind of thing. Mm. So when I first got to hear him play, and what, the thing that Derek May taught me was to, you know, always stick to your guns and sometimes people aren't going to like what you play. But if you're a real DJ. A craftsman. You, but if a real DJ has a personality, that's, that's, mm. as, that's as simple as I can say it. Do you know what I mean? Like when you hear Groove Rider, you know Groove Rider's on. When you yeah. hear Fabio, you know Fabio's on. You don't need mm. to look up to the decks, do you know what I mean? So true. When you, <laughs> hear, when, when, you, when you hear Randall... You know you're in safe hands when Doc Scott's on decks, you know I, what I mean? But I just think, like, that's what a real DJ is, do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's someone that's expressing their personality through what they're playing. You can, like, you can play the same records as someone else, but it's the, you put it together in a different way, you know? Mad. So yeah. I remember when Derek May came over, he was so far in the future. This is, like, 1990, mm. so we're still kind of in the rave days and mm. people want to hear you know, fucking smarties tunes and things mm -hmm. like that kind of thing. There was like a mixture Charlie of... Charlie says. Yeah, you know, but that was cool yeah. because we're all, you know, we're all 18, 19, mm -hmm. dropping E's and nobody really knows any different. Mm -hmm. But Derek May came from Detroit and he was like... So he, I remember he played like a couple of tunes which were kind of like token gestures to the crowd, but the, pretty much it was like fucking Detroit techno. And oh, half... Uh, no, I wouldn't say half. I'd say about 40% of the crowd walked out of this big fucking warehouse. But he was just like, he just did his thing. Yeah. And that stuck with me forever because it was like, what is the point of him flying this guy all the way from Detroit mm. to England to play and then him just play all the popular rave tunes yeah. of the time? Exactly. That makes no sense. And further, furthermore, fuck that because you know what happens? You open a Pandora's box when you come to these genres that are imported into a club, mate. So <sighs> when I first started going DJing overseas, when drum and bass first started going international, that always resonated with me. You yeah, know I mean? bet. You know, and it's just like, I'm here to represent myself and I'm rep I represent drum and bass. Mm -hmm. And I'm very proud of the fact that uh, through that period of uh, mid-90s, I was either the first or the second or the third DJ to go to Japan or mm. Australia or America or wherever. So they were really pioneering days. But if, yeah, we'd, have gone, but if we'd have gone there Wild. and just pandered and played a little, just some thinking, oh, be, been worried about yeah. if the crowd were into it or not. I can remember when me and Goldie, we did a tour of um, California, mm. San Francisco, LA, and then we did some little place in between, which was really weird. But they wanted to hear UK drum and bass, you know, yeah. or, you know what I mean? They like, wanted to absorb what the royal was. So, yeah. and, I, you know, that lesson I learned 
early on from Derek May was just like, just do, just do your thing, man. Do you know what I mean? And mm -hmm. maybe, maybe half the crowd might walk off the dance floor, but that's because they're not ready. Mm -hmm. But but they'll get it in two years from now. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. When they get the tape or whatever. And that's the thing. And I, I know I know people that said, oh, when I first heard Derek May play, or when I first heard Groove Rider play, when F Groove first started coming up to the Midlands. Mm -hmm. um, some people weren't ready for that shit, man. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Because he was fucking four to the floor and proper shit, man. He wasn't fucking around, man. Mm -hmm. And some people weren't ready for that shit. Mm -hmm. But then I had friends with it say, oh, you know, when, when Groove Rider first started coming up, man, I didn't really like it, but now I get it. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Now I get it two years later. And Sometimes just, you need that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, the gateway. We, we went off on a tangent. This is going to happen a lot, by the way. <laughs> but hey, say, hey, listen to the podcast. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, so Goldie signed my book, which was the tangent. Mm -hmm. And then... We were communicating with each other via our music, via Groove Rider. He was going to Rage. Groove was coming up, playing at the Eclipse in Coventry at the time a lot. And that was, it. Mm. That was for those who don't know, that was the first venue in the UK that had an yeah. eight o'clock license. Yeah. It was groundbreaking. And it was in my home city. It was like, I always say to people... Was that like your favourite venue? It was important for me... Career wise, mm. it was an incredible venue. I mean, how they got an eight o'clock license, I have no fucking idea. Mm. It was to this day, I mean, it was run by gangsters, man. Do you know what I mean? It was run by really dodgy fucking guys. Um, this mad he got away with that one. But um, I say to people as well, you do need an element of luck in this business, in any business, really. You know, you, know, you need to be in the right place at the right time. But the, but, yeah. the, but the key is to realize you're in the right place yeah. at the right time and then maximize it. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So when you know, like when I was playing at these amnesia house parties in, in the 90s and that put me on the map around the UK because every people would come in there from up north, from down south, mm. from all over the from all over England. So after doing those parties and I was playing in Manchester and playing in Liverpool and playing in Leeds and everything. The one thing I couldn't crack was London because London at that time was if you weren't from London, you weren't you weren't playing. You can make a bit of money out of all of those areas. Oh yeah, London is just like that. But yeah, but London for me was the was the one mm. was where I wanted to play, man. Do you know what I mean? Because I wanted to, you know, I'd gone down to those places, and I felt like I deserved to be down there. But I knew you're gonna you, take a hit. <laughs> you need you need you need an in. Do you know what I mean? Mm. And that's where meeting Goldie really opened the door because Goldie. That when I first met Goldie in I think beginning of 1992. And it was just by chance. I mean, we'd been asking about each other via Groove. Groove was coming up to the Midlands and every now and then I'd have the courage to go and ask him what a tune was. Mm. And he'd say, oh, it's this guy Goldie. And I'd say, who the, who the mm. fuck is Goldie? Mm. And then when Groove was <laughs> playing down south and, well, G didn't have a problem. He would go up and say, oh, Groove, what's his tune? And he'd be like, oh, it's this guy, Doc Scott, from, you know, from Coventry. Mm. I'd be like, what do you mean from Coventry? And then one time I was in, in North London at Music Power Records, went in there to go and get some records. And Groove's in there. And I was like, all right, gee. And he's like, I've got someone who wants to meet you. And that was Goldie. Oh, and that was, shit. So it was just by chance. And so Yeah, is that how it happened? That's exactly how it happened. And we met each other in Music Power and like beginning of early 92. So maybe before even late, the, like, you didn't even connect the dots that it was... The, the, oh, I know who he was. But no, but like as in like in terms of being living so close, you'd not cross paths. No, 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 no. You had to be then with, with Groove. Yeah, and then so we got chatting... And we just like chatted and chatted and chatted. And he was like, what are you doing, man? And I was like, well, nothing. I was going to go back home. He was like, come back with me, man. Let's go to Rage because it was a Thursday. And I was like, all right, cool, man. Fuck it, I'm not doing anything. Because mm. I always used to do my record shopping or cutting dubs on the Thursday. And then Friday, Saturday's DJ and Sunday's mm. Sunday, Sunday. Mm -hmm. And so I went back to his and he was listen, listen, uh, living in a Swiss cottage at the time. And we just talked and talked. To and it was really weird, man, because I've never hit it off with anyone so quickly. Like you know what I mean? Spark of... Just like we were just, I don't know, just we connected souls, man. But we're very, very opposite, man. Do you know what I mean? He's like a larger than life character. I'm a bit shy. I'm a, I'm quite happy to be, you know, under the radar kind of thing. But we just kind of hit off because we, we just had this insane love of music and an insane love of, um, of Groove, Fabio and Groove Rider as well. And we were just excited about the same things, man. Do you know what I mean? So we went to Rage that night, dropped a couple of E's, had the time of our lives, went back to his, um, watched the sun come up. And that was it, man. We were like best friends from, from that day, from that one, to, from that 24 hour period. How much moment do you hold of, of moments like that? What, like, you know, the, 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 you romantically put 
and so genteelly put you watch the sun come up and how, like th- these does this does this connect with you on a on a spiritual level in the fact that it was like a so informative of a year and being with him being under the fucking sun some things are, some things are meant to be and i'm not like um i'm not like a religious person mm. or i wouldn't even say i'm a spiritual person although i have become more spiritual as, as i've got older and my mm. eyes you know as you, uh, you know eyes become wider yeah You've got no Excuse choice me. but to be spiritualized yeah. as you get older. It's like yeah. you've got no choice. <laughs> and, um, and then I told him that story about a couple of weeks after that. I came down and, um, with the book. Mm. And I said, I'm going to tell you a story now and it's going to fucking blow your mind. So I pulled out this book and I showed him, yeah. his, showed him his tag and he was like, and he, I could see the confusion on his yeah. face. You know what I mean? He was like, well, what's, yeah. how have you got this? I said, I came to see you in 1986 or 87, whenever, whenever this thing was. And the whole, you know, the thing had gone full circle. Mm. You know, I'd met him like, so this was like five or six years before this moment. And, and it, was, it, was a, it was a beautiful thing, man. And he just, he just got in with Reinforced. I think he'd just done his first 12 on Reinforced. And that's, mm. Reinforced were like... Big up Reinforced. M- massive love to Reinforced. <laughs> my my, my whole my, beatboxing, beatbox drum and bass was because of their... My their spiritual place. home is Reinforced Records. It really is, man. Like, I mean, when I first started making music in 91, my God, I had three favourite labels, uh, Suburban Bass, Reinforced, and there was another one, I can't remember, Moving Shadow, probably. Moving Shadow, oh. Um, but out the, out the three of them, I, f- I felt more of a connection and a draw towards Reinforced. Mm. And I just thought to myself, if I can get in there that will be my gateway into London to DJ. And then you know, once you get in there, then you've mm. hopefully got to not fuck it up and mm-hmm. then, then you get invited back. And then, um, yeah, Goldie, Goldie took me down to meet Mark and Digo, Four Hero. And the, Four Hero, man. You know, the, 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 yeah. the, you know. Oh, geez, the yeah, legends. you know, just, I remember going down there and yeah. I couldn't even like really speak. I was that like, kind of nervous and everything. And then I just <laughs> made a few tunes that I thought might fit the label. So I went down there. This is only a few months after um, knowing Goldie and went down there with a cassette of here come, the original Here Come the Drums and something else. Mm-hmm. And um, so I went down to Dollis Hill. Goldie and Digo got in the car and we went to get some food. And I said, oh, I'm, I've done this tune. Like, have a listen. Let me, let me know what you think. So we're driving down Kilburn High Road, playing this thing. And uh, I can't remember who said it. it was either Goldie or Digo said, stop the car, stop the car. So I pulled over and they both got out and I thought, oh, fucking hell. I've, what have I done? What have I, I've, <laughs> I've, I've blown it, you know. <laughs> I I just, and, they, and they got in the car. I'll be driving home now. And uh, they both came back. You know, the doors were still open. They both came back and they both popped their pin. They were like, what, what are you doing? What, what is this? I was like, something I've been working on, something I've done. Hmm. They were like, this has to be on Reinforced. And I was like, Really? And they were like, they were like, this has to be on reinforced. This has to be on reinforced. And I was like, fucking, it's yours. You can have it. I got four tracks here, and that was the first EP that was on reinforced. And then I was there for for two yeah. for two years making music. And that, those those years, ninety two to ninety four, were the most fun I ever had making music, and the most fun I ever had. Well, not wasn't the most fun, but. Getting on Reinforced, open the door to London, and then mm. I could DJ in London, and then um, once I was in London, it was a, yeah. it, was, it was bliss, man. Do you know what it's I mean? Then, about... then I felt like I'd, I'd felt like I'd made it, and then yeah. so to be on then those lineups playing alongside Fabio and Groove Rider in London was just like breathtaking. Just what? Just, but it was like you know when you have a, when you have any kind of goal, whatever mm. it is, whether it be. You know, to, to get signed to a label, to design a, a new jacket, or what you know, whatever, whatever mm. it is, man. When you, when you achieve a, a goal that sometimes you didn't think was achievable, mm. it was huge, man. I was so fucking happy. It sounds to me like you pinpointed it. You went in for a, you moved in a way that it it, it, it was so specific. The lane you went there, I kind of knew. You took it to the mountain. I, you know, I kind of knew, like I say, at the, at the time, it was very, very difficult to DJ in London if you weren't from London because they just had so many good DJs. Yeah. I mean, it was like a closed shop. It wasn't anything like, well, they had a 
personal thing from people that were up from north or wherever. Mm -hmm. We're just like, why should we book this guy from the Midlands when, when we've got like, when, when we've got twenty fantastic DJs down here, man? Do you know what I mean? So you have to have a breakthrough tune. You have to have something with. Uh, I had to get foot in the door. Do yeah. you know what I mean? And then there was a there was this promotion called um, what were they called? They, I think they were called Elevation. Or maybe it's Club Elevation. I can't remember. And then that was one of the first times I played in London. They they had a club on Shaftesbury Avenue, which is where Movement used to be. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. And then um, and I, I remember I was so nervous, man. So I got invited. I was to play. a kid at this point. I was. This was everything was so misty and. Uh, and then I got invited to play there, <sighs> and I was so nervous because I knew, you know, probably wouldn't get a second chance. Do you know what I mean? Mm. So you knew you had to go down there and just. Play the best set you Nailed could possibly get, yeah. yeah. and thankfully, played a, played a cool set. And then what was cool was there were loads of people in. Like Paul from IB for Records was in there. Um, one of the guys from Living Dream Records was in there. Mm. So all of a sudden, I got connected to all this whole world, and then started getting dub plates from there. And then it's cool as shit. Oh man, you know, because at the end of the day, the end of the day, the reason I got the reason I got into any of this, man, is because I love fucking music, man. Mm. I love it. I love it so much, man. That's and the I, driving force to anything. If you love what you're doing, then it just won't stop, will it? No. Nah, and I love sharing music with people. Mm. And I love getting dubs, not because it makes me feel good and I've got exclusives, just because the, the, the better music you have, one, yeah, it makes you... It, it can make you a better DJ, mm. but it's just like, I love sharing music with people. So I want to get the, the best music I possibly can. It's AP before them. And then you, you can know. start calling them out and saying, Hey, look, check this out. So to get those connections so early on, you know what I'm So, and then back into like 92, 93 into 94, mm. I got to know Frost and, and Brian through going to rage hooked up. And I was playing in Bristol at the time as well. I hooked up with Ronnie, Di and Crust. So, yeah. Pretty much had all those bases covered. Yeah, do you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And at the end of the day, those guys don't give you tunes if they don't respect you. That's the bottom line. Do you know what I mean? So you have to earn these guys mm. respect, whether mm. it be through making music or DJing. Mm. Do you know what I mean? I can remember the first time I met Die was at an illegal, illegal party. I played in, I think I played in Swindon. And then there was this illegal party going Big on. Big up Die. He don't get enough shine, man. King of the rollers, man. Yeah, He's I'm one of the kings, you, man. Skate or die, hold tight. Yep. And then... I got invited to, they said, that, oh, there's an illegal party going on because down in the Southwest Island, there's loads of, you know, big free enough, parties. Yeah. And so I was like, yeah, man, fuck it, man, let's, let's go. So I've gone to this thing and I said, okay, you can go on at like six o'clock. And it's just this like stage in the middle of a field. And I'm playing and the sun's coming up. And then Dai comes, that's when the first time I met Dai, he comes up to me, he goes, oh man, you're playing some wicked tunes, man. Well, the funny thing about that story is, I remember I turning around as the sun's coming up. Behind us is a frigging runway. There's like an airport. And there's like planes, like little planes landing and things. And then the police came, but there was too many people for them to stop it. I remember the police, all they were concerned about was that people were dancing. They got over this fence and they were dancing on the runway, or near the runway. <laughs> there's like these little planes coming You ever been to a rave on a runway? What the fuck? Yeah, that was like crazy days, man. And that's the first time I met Di. What? So it's like, um, and then he just come up to me, said, "Man, he just come up to me, said, man, you're playing some wicked tunes, man." And then when I went down to Bristol and then I met those guys, and just started sharing mm. tunes and everything, and then you know, it's like friendships for years, man. And it's all about, <sighs> it's all about getting your foot in the door. Do you know what I mean? D DJ Die, you know, going back to some of the ar archives in the podcasts, and you know, the relationship, the extracurricular or other pastime pleasures that DJs, producers in drum and bass have. I, know, I think Kenny Ken was into his graph. I think Jumpin' Jack Frost was big into his hip-hop. In terms, in terms of graffiti, I always, you know, we spoke about this before, mm. I think drum and bass and drum and bass jungle and graffiti have similar souls. You know, mm. they come from the same place. Um, they're both from, they're both from originally from the streets. They are, they're yeah. Be, you know, like, and... I admire I admire graffiti I admire graffiti that's in a in a, um, in a gallery. Mm -hmm. I admire street art, you know, and I admire or I have no problem with drum and bass when it goes commercial or or if a pop act wants a drum and bass mix and mm -hmm. the more commercial side of things. But for me, like the the real deal stuff is the stuff that's kind of a bit gritty and a mm -hmm. bit grimy mm -hmm. and you know, gets dirt under your fingernails kind yeah. of thing. But and so I've always seen graffiti and drum and bass they Okay, they're two different mediums, but they're very similar in their um, 
in their DNA. You know what I mean? Mm. They come from the same place. I mean, it's very natural now. I mean, d- don't get me wrong. The, the compatibility is insane. I think it's like a fine wine. The more you get these things together. Sure. But at the time, I meant like it, it's um, because it's so given now. You know, it's just sure, such a sure. given. I don't know. I think, I think maybe because I was so close to G. Mm. I mean, at the time, you know, he was doing, he, he did the reinforced logo. And then at the time when he was, when, when we were cutting dub plates, he would, um, he would inscribe all the all the plate, all mm-hmm. the dub plate, the reinforced dub plates mm-hmm. individually with all these like graph letters and stuff. That's and do mad. and do like all this unique artwork and do us labels and everything. So we so when we were going out playing our dubs, they weren't just like black or they had music house stickers on. They would yeah. have the R or the skull, but then they'd have all these unique designs and everything. Do you know what I mean? So I think just being so close to him for so long, it's always been it's always been one and the same. For yeah. Me. Do, do you know what I mean? I uh, know. Exactly. Dude, I remember, and I'm, I'm almost certain you were in the documentary as well, but there was this one particular documentary and I can only remember snapshots cause I was so young, but like, I remember break dancing with drum and with jungle and, and it just, it, it epitomized so much of what I think the UK had been like. There were some amazing acts, amazing UK hip hop homegrowns that were coming from Demon Boys, London mm-hmm. Posse, like blah blah. Like we know all the names, but there was something about Jungle that was almost like, oh yeah, this is ours now. I think, you know, one of the it's the bastard child of rave music, rave music, For sure. drum and bass. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you know what I mean? I've heard that before. Yeah, that's, it's, that's it's, it. <laughs> it, it. It really is, man. And it, yeah. it, it's unique to the UK. I mean, Fabio and Groove Rider kind of set the blueprint because when at Rage, they were kind of mixing break beats over techno tunes. Do you know what I mean? Which kind of led to jungle techno. So when we started making music in this country, we were obviously still using 4 4 kick drums. Yeah. But just you know, putting brakes over, aiming brakes, and more swagger or, tempo, isn't it? Yeah, yeah and and, a, and I think yeah. um, and then throwing B lines in there as mm. well because you know because we got the dub sound system kind of mm. culture here. It was everything. It was fucking everything. Man. The, the, yes, the, yes, the beautiful yes. thing I always say to people, and when, when I speak to people now, as someone that is a DJ and runs a record label and tries to give people advice, up and coming producers, mm. if they ask for it, is don't. Um, you know, don't pigeon, don't pigeon, don't um, don't uh, stay in the lane so much. Mm. Like drum and bass. One of the beautiful things about drum and bass is there's no rules. You can do whatever you can do whatever you want. Mm. You can literally do whatever you want. Do you find that that a lot of people just stick within a? Uh, uh, do they restrict themselves because they, of? Th- I I think so, and I think there's there's. Because I'm loving the rollers that are coming out at the moment. Some fucking there's some. I think. I mean, people hark on about the mid 90s or the late 90s as the the golden age of drum and bass and yeah it was a special moment in time because things were being done then that had never been done big up ray keith as well actually by the way 100 percent yeah um as was (laughs) yeah last gig i did was back to back to back with ray keith yeah february 28th let's get out of this please Uh, yeah we've had enough that's right um but the the beautiful thing about drum and bass is there's no rules Mm. you know you can you can do whatever you want it's it's such a blank canvas mm. to to go nuts with, man. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And drum and bass at its best is when the 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 the, the, the person making it doesn't give a shit. Doesn't give a shit. And and also it, the roots, know. the roots of the, the, the like you say the integrity, what you what your desires are, your passion and love for the thing, and your roots go way deep, way deep. And just if we may, just go. In, back to the graffiti just mm-hmm. slightly if you're at all scared of graffiti talk right now hold tight we're going in uh birmingham yep battered buses yeah yeah you were part of that fraternity you were part of the hey i'm gonna tag the fuck and i don't give a fuck yeah. i'm going all out i'm destroying everything that i see you were one of those guys back in the day he doesn't get more roots than that no i mean that, i mean that's why i mean that's that's why i'm here that's why i found this podcast man because the thing was Taking a, taking a year off, because we've all had to take a year off, being mm. off the road, um, I had this extra time on my hands and I ended up going down rabbit holes of just watching um, little short videos mm. on on graph and whatever and then discovered your podcast. Mm. And then I just reconnected with that inner, that inner child of mine, mm. the one from the 80s, from, from the age of 14 to 18. Mm. Like you say, we didn't have... Um, I'm from Coventry, down the road from Birmingham, Wolverhampton, West Bromwich, 
was all run by West Midlands Travel. We didn't have a metro system. We didn't have an underground. No. But we had buzzes. Buzzes, as we say. <laughs> buzzes. buzzes. And we used to fucking bomb the fuck out of them. Big man. shout out I mean? to my Coventry crew. Big shout out to Birmingham all day. Come on. And uh, and I know, like, for you know, graffiti from, from a London perspective is, like, London and then everything else is, well, what happened, mm. you know. But I always say you can only, you can only, you can only, bomb or you can only be king of where you're from or what's in front of you. Do you, know, point, yeah, do you know what I mean? Yeah. And, uh, you know, 14, 15 years old, I'm from Coventry. I'm not going to be traveling anywhere else. Mm. And, but no, I lived that life um, f- about four years obsessed. Yeah. Loved it, man. Like, it gave me, it gave me an escape from the, from the personal issues I was having at home with my parents splitting up and everything. Mm. But I was also, I was drawn to graffiti anyway. I kind of found it fascinating. Like when I first saw um, Star Wars, you know, and just mm. I was like, "Holy fucking shit, man!" And just the, and just the the idea that a nobody can be a somebody, that anybody can be a somebody yeah. if you're prepared to put the work in. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Was really appealing to me, man, yeah. because at the time I felt like I was like everyone does when you're 13, 14. Mm. You don't know you don't know anything, man. But like I say, I hooked up with a, a crew of like-minded people, and then once you got, once you start going out and putting your name up, it becomes addictive. It's so addictive, man. Mm. Like I've had addictions in my life, like real addictions, but nothing is more addictive than getting up. It really isn't. It's <laughs> so addictive. And I um, didn't love it. <laughs> and um, yeah, it got to the point. So from 15, 16, 17 years old. I was sleeping out in parks so I could jump over the wall of the bus depot at three o'clock in the morning and Mm. smash everything. And Mm. we're doing it like five, six days a week, you know, for three or four years. Midlands have got it going on, right? Birmingham has got it going on. Like you guys, and and big up Tempo, big up Zuki, big up, big up Bones, big, big shout out to everyone else, everyone. Um, Some as well. I I mean, Void. God, I mean, the names will continue, but, um, when I went there, Crutz, and when I went there, it was just, oh, yo, you, that 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 style, that Birmingham style, mm-hmm. is still there. Big shout, Causa. Uh, you know, it was just, it's just so much. A lot of street stuff as well, like heavy. I said, because we, because we don't because we don't have the underground. Riverside, so, yeah, 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 buses, yeah. Like you, you're taking alternative approaches, and that was what was inspiring, man. I was like, yeah. Well. I, I can remember that time. I mean, it was funny because I listened to the Zuki podcast, and he, I remember him. You know, he's speaking about that mid '80s period. Sometimes you'd get on a bus and you couldn't even tag anything because there was no space. No space. You just go upstairs and be like, "Oh fuck!" And you have to get off because it was literally there's no. They were really? just so obliterated. Whoa. Do you know what I mean? And but why don't we see any pictures? I just, you know, I have to do the edits on these things. And we're talking about this now. I know I'm going to Kel, I'm, I know what you're going through right now, mate. You're trying to find some buses that have been, but they're not around. You cannot find. I know, mate. A it's, anyway. it's a shame because when I because I got done when I got caught, and because Coventry at the time that that kind of 85, 86, 87 period, it was out of control. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like it was there was so many people doing it that they just you know. And this is before CCTV or anything like that. Before cameras, by the sounds of it, yeah, they just yeah, didn't yeah. photo anything, huh? Well, we we I but like I said, I had a load. I had a load of photos, and I used to go to Birmingham and photo Sally Oak, and um, I used to come down to London sometimes as well as a as a just and ride the trains. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's, and, that was always a joy. Wasn't and just it? take yeah. loads of photos. Oh. And but Coventry was the first place where they put CCTVs on the buses uh. as a trial. Because and I was one of the first people to get caught. Were you? Yeah, unfortunately. Oh shit. Um. And it was really funny, man, because I remember, you know, I knew, I, I remember when I kind of realized that they were following me home and they were, do you know what I mean? They kind of, I, I knew I was going to get caught, you know, I, I just knew because we, we used to like, we used to sleep out. There was a park opposite Pool Meadow, which was like the main bus depot in Coventry. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. We used to sleep out in there. Well, I say sleep out, stay out there until two or three in the morning and then jump over the wall. And just smack every fucking bus that you couldn't go inside. Who would you stroll it with? Who, so who was we? Um, we had a crew that we called WMT. Mm-hmm. We took the initials from West Midlands Travel and it was called We Mean Trouble. Ooh. And, um, okay. and there was a, about six of us at the time. Uh, we like, you know, no one famous, but mm. we, we did our thing in Coventry mm. and we were, we were kings of our little castle, uh, mm. of our little mound, you know mm. what I mean? And, um, 
you know, they wanted to make an example of people. Do you know what I mean? They wanted to try and crack down. And uh, I, can remember, I, mean, I can remember getting off the bus one time, um, my bus to take me home. I, don't know, I wasn't driving, I was 15 or whatever. And it was like a van kind of followed me. And I was like, and I kind of just felt like I was going to get caught. Mm. And then, but the thing was that just, I thought, fuck it, man. If I'm going to get caught, I'm just going to do as much as I possibly Go can. And we used to, so we used to do, <laughs> we used to do like the bus depot and come out of there at five in the morning just before the drivers would come in and do like the first bus runs. But we do every single bus so they couldn't take them out of service. And we do it on a Friday night because all the kids used to go into the, ta- you know, the ta- mm-hmm. city centre on, on a Saturday. And then we used to sit in the main, where all the buses would come in and just sit there opposite like where people used to go in and buy their tickets and whatever and just sit there for all afternoon watching the buses come in with our names on, on the front, on the back, on the driver's fucking door, wow. and everything. And we knew, they knew who we were. It was like, fuck it, man. We just, mm. you know. Because you'd pass that. And then you just... You know, you're 15, you don't give a mm. shit. Mm. But I, I kind of knew I was going to get caught. So when I got raided, when the police came and raided my house, um, the one thing I was gutted, they took all my pit, they took all my photos. I had a, I have a few left. They took everything, man. They took, they were so fucking stupid. Mm. You know what I mean? They, like two mm. vans came, come into the house. Well, like, yeah, the big ones. Like I was a fucking, like I was some kind of drug dealer or something, man. It's like I'm a 16 year old kid that was writing my name on buses. Damn. Damn. Yeah, and they kind of came in and they took every. They took like felt tip. I had a little my brother. He's like six years younger than me, so I was sixteen. So he was twelve. They took all these coloring sets and everything. They took everything. It was so fucking stupid. But at that time, they wanted to make example. Like there were people in Birmingham that were going to jail at that time. You know what I mean? That were getting caught because they wanted to make examples of people. Wow. You know what I mean? To try and to try mm. and to try and put a stop to it. I was kind of lucky. They were they were going to send me to a detention centre, but they t- they sent me to attendance centre. So every Saturday afternoon, I had to go to this fucking horrible place. Was it like community service for young offenders or something? Kind of like that, yeah. yeah. And it was to kind of keep me off, keep me away. And mm. I was banned from doing this. Even if I'd have done this, that, and the other, then I would have gone to, mm. you know. And then, but I stopped. I'm a DJ. I'm a future <laughs> DJ. You've got to let me, let me out. But, um, <laughs> but I stopped for a little bit. But then I just changed my name and carried on for a bit. Yeah, did you? Yeah, it's oh, yeah. because it's just like I say, it's addictive. What did you used to write? What was that? D two, D double E two was what I used to write. That's what I got caught for. And then I changed my name to B four. Nice. And then, um, and then I was pretty much active eighty six, eighty seven. And then I had two um, near misses, which kind of I think when we spoke initially on the phone. I had two incidences in, in the space of about six months. There's one time I was walking the line, walking into New Street Station, just kind of doing fucking mm. little tags and throw-ups and things, about two o'clock in the morning. We'd, we'd get off on the local train. I think it was Yardley. I can't remember. Whatever the local station is before New Street, going from Coventry. And then you just walk the line and you try and get as close as you could to the platforms mm. and, you know, do your thing. Mm. And it's about two o'clock in the morning. So walking the line, man, and this fucking train comes out of nowhere. Like I think it was a mail train or something. Obviously, they don't they don't sound horns or fuck all because they're, they're not expecting anything to be around. Yeah. So we walk in the line, and um, I kind of turn around. I just see this fucking train like bearing down on me. And I dive to the side, and just lay down, and there's, there's about that much gap between that and the wall. Whoa. And this train's like thundering past me, like you know, terrifying. Man, do you know what I mean? Whoa. So. That was a fucking, that was like super scary. You know what I mean? Because if I had, if I'd have seen this thing maybe 10, 20 seconds later, I probably yeah, would have got yeah. hit by it. Do you know what I mean? And then about three or four months after that, um, I was surfing a bus. I think it was Zuki mentioned this. Like we used to, the thing we used to do was jack the emergency exit on the upper deck. You'd, you'd put this thing down so you could open it and the alarm wouldn't go off. And then you'd lean out the back and write your name on the back of the bus. And sometimes if you're goofing around, you'd hang out the back of the bus and just jerk around. Yeah, so, I was surf- so I was surfing that. this bus and this fucking bus went over a humpback bridge and I'm kind of hanging out the back of the bus writing my name and it's gone over a humpback bridge. So yeah, so my, I've you lost jumped, my grip. Yeah. Lost my grip. And you know that when people say um, your life flashes oh, before your eyes. Or, I can just think of it now. It's horrible. Oh, I and, gave me um, the jump then. And um, so it's really weird, man, because I can remember it so vividly was everything kind of stopped. You know what I mean? And I, re- I knew, I realised that I wasn't holding on to the bus anymore. Do you know oh, what I mean? Oh, fuck that. And all I could think of, the, the thing that went through my head was cover your head. Just cover your head. Do you know what I mean? Cover your head. So I fell from the, from the upper deck of this bus. And this bus was kind of going. It was, I think it was like the last bus of the night. So the last bus of the night is always kind of motoring back to the depot. And I just braced for impact. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. 
hit the ground, rolled across the road. Thankfully, there were no cars coming be- either behind or on the Yo, other side of the road. That's a high fucking drop, man. Yeah. And this, like I say, this thing was kind of going at some speed. And uh, I, I kind of came to, and in, in, I was literally lying in the gutter, you know, on the, on the opposite side of the road. And the guys that were, that were with me, they jumped off at the next bus stop and ran back. And I went to put my trainer back on my foot and it wouldn't go on. I was like, what the fuck's going on? I looked at my foot and my foot's kind of like hanging in the opposite direction. I'd kind of land, you know, like when you jump from a, well, in the old, you can't do it now. But remember like when the old trains and you could open the door and jump off before it, mm-hmm. you jump from a moving object. Yeah. It's, you get that kind of reaction, Jumped, don't you? Yeah. So I'd landed on my, you know, I'd landed on my right ankle, my foot spun around and shattered my ankle Broke my leg in about four places. Yo, you were lucky. <laughs> Super lucky, man. But that's what I mean. So I'd had two, wow. it, two instances in about three months where I could have got killed. And at this time, this was, I think it was, this was 1988, so I was 17 at the time. And then I was in hospital then for about six weeks. They couldn't operate for a week because the swelling was so bad. At one point, they even thought they might have to amputate my foot because it was so fucking fucked really? up. Really? So when you're lying in hospital and you can't sleep, you're full of painkillers and everything, you can't, you're can't. lying there and you're thinking, do I really want to carry on with this? Or maybe, you know, I've had two near misses here. I don't want to wait for the third one. You know what I mean? Yeah. So that was the kind of end of my, my, you know, graph days, whatever, kind of came to an abrupt halt. And, uh, and then I, I thought to myself, maybe I should push more towards the music side of things, yeah, more towards yeah. the DJ kind of thing. That being said... Honest to God, man, those, that period of my life was probably the most fun I ever had. Mm. I fucking loved every fucking minute of it, man. I mean, aside from the, obviously, the, these aforementioned stories, like, is there anything in your life that replaces that lifestyle and buzz and desire that graffiti brings to you? Not, no, it's, it's, it's a unique feeling. I mean... DJing is, is, is an amazing feeling. Do you know what I mean? And um, the, the first time I heard one of my own records being played by another DJ was one of the best feelings. Jumping Jack Frost. Mm-hmm. Hell to the Frost. Oh, hell, Frost. Um, and the Frost Report. Make sure you check yeah, that out. check that out. Banging podcast. Um, that was an amazing feeling, especially coming from like a made man, one of my heroes, one of the guys I looked up to, 1991, I was 19 at the time, I think, just maybe just turned 20. Mm. Sitting there, five o'clock in the morning, Frost is playing the last set, Donington Park, 10,000 people, and he plays my tune. I'm sitting there just going, fuck. Yeah. Amazing. Top of the world. That being said, there's nothing... Graffiti and everything that it, that it involves, the illegal side of it, the, the skullduggery, the seeing your name the next day, mm. someone coming up to you and saying, hey man, I saw your name on whatever bridge or whatever it was. It's a, it's a unique thing, man. And that's why I've got so much love and admiration for these guys and all the guys you've had on your podcast, man, because I lived that life for a little bit. And even if you didn't live it, you can admire what these guys do. Mm. Like just driving down here, down there today, mm. fucking 10 foot on the bridges mm-hmm. coming down here. Do you know what I mean? Mm. I'll type 10. You know, and... Yeah. um. I got nothing but admiration and love for all these guys, man, that done it past, present, future. The guys that are out there now mm-hmm. doing it because it's so fucking hard to do it now. Yeah. You know what I mean? When I was doing it in the 80s, man, it was like a lot easier. You know, no CCTV and whatever. Like the, the lengths these guys have to go through now to fucking get up, man. Yeah. It's insane. Um, different kinds of buzzes, man. Mm. But, I mean, I always say... If I could have had, if I could have, a, if I could have my life over and maybe have a different life, be born somewhere else in a different time, I would love to have been 16 years old, um, early 80s New York. Mm. When, because I, I watched Star Wars, I watched Star Wars recently, mm. man, and I just think, man, what a time mm. to be alive, man. I always get really jealous of Goldie, man. I can't believe you went to New York and painting trains, man. <laughs> Jesus Christ, man, that's. Yeah, he's, I mean, that's you know, like this is you know this is some biblical. These are like. This is the DNA of this the podcast. If it was it for Star but it's, Wars, but it's a, but it's a weird thing, man. Because I mean, graffiti is a lot more acceptable now than than it ever was. Mm. Do you know what I mean? But I still think there's a lot of people that don't understand graffiti or just see it as mindless vandalism or whatever. Do you know what I mean? Um, 
Which I might add, this podcast is definitely not for you. <laughs> um, you know, so you the wrong place. <laughs> as, a, as, a, as you know, it's more accepted now than it ever has been. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Um, but it still has. I don't know. It's kind of weird, man. I mean, why do you think that is, Doc? Why, why, why do you think it's more accepted? No, why? Or, why what? do you think people have this? Um, uh, yeah, this 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 thing in their head. This almost like preconceived. A built-in idea that um, art has to be one way and not the other, and, and graffiti I, is is bad. I don't, I don't know, man. I mean, I don't know. I mean, you know, to some people, it's always going to be vandalism. Man. Do you know what I mean? Or M- mindless vandalism, yeah. I guess. Um, I mean, you know, some of the stories I've heard on your podcast, and and then, you know, the people that have gone to jail, jail for a long time, man. Do you know mm-hmm. what I mean? Mm-hmm. Fucking listen. Okay, I get it it costs X amount of money to clean the train mm. or whatever. But there are people out there doing way worse things mm. that don't go to fucking jail, that don't, you know, do any, get any, well, I say, they do get ramifications of their actions. Mm. But in comparison, it's fucking ludicrous, man. It's right. ludicrous that people that you've had on here have gone to jail for fucking three years for painting some yeah. trains. And then there are people that have done unspeakable fucking things, you know, to, yeah. to, to other human beings. Yeah, 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 yeah. And not had the same kind of sentence. That to, that to me blows my fucking mind, man. You know, Do you know blo- what I mean? Yeah, and what blows my mind, I mean, what people have to understand is when it comes to, uh, you know, street art, street culture, being a DJ like yourself, successful, award-winning DJ, being the graffiti writer that, you know, rags to riches, ends up being in an exhibition... Fucking graph is a route passage of, and you have to go through all them processes to be able to. You know, people don't live in the same class as what a lot of these people that are complaining about the, yeah. the you know the the damage that it does. It's like, well, well, fucking fix it and shut up. Well, you know, there's there's there's, there's a lot of people that don't like, you know, nightlife culture. I mean, yeah. look look at all the problems. Oh, yeah, all that, of that. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, London. I mean, pre-pandemic has had a. Look how many clubs have closed here in London mm. over the last 10, 20 years. They're all getting gentrified. Mm. You know what I mean? And then it's cultural appropriation. Yeah. You know, and so there, there are venues now that I've played at for years yeah. that have now been told, your music's too loud. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, I fucking hate that. Pubs, people that live above pubs that right. have a DJ set booth or have a live band area you know irish pubs that you know just you get the rowdy workers man like what the fuck are you talking about you can't it would turn the music down turn the sound down. you're mad yeah well you know the bass it's too much bass man I'm, like, yeah. I'm sorry we've been here for 15 years yeah. man what are you talking about yeah, yeah. The, Do you know what yeah, i mean yeah the smoking area is a smoking area you don't like it don't live around here you know it's those sorts of things isn't it there's um there's always this you know at the end of the day there's always it's just snobbery right mm. you know you know and there's some people that don't like any form of street culture, man, you know, in whatever, whatever the form it comes in. Man. I, mean, I mean, drum and bass, man, is like, um, it's always fought against that. It, mm-hmm. Drum and bass is like, it's funny, man. Drum and bass has been declared dead by the mainstream dance media in my lifetime at least half a dozen times. Yeah. It's hilarious, man. Goes it's, in and out of fashion in the magazines, all of a sudden it's dead, yeah. alive, dead, dead, alive. Dead. You know, and but, but it keeps going, man. But but the, be- the, love about it. the beautiful thing is about the drum and bass scene, kind of like the graffiti scene, is nobody runs it, nobody owns it, nobody is funding it. Mm. It's it's like the internet, it's just there, mm. it's self sufficient, it will always be there. Same as skateboarding, same as beatboxing. Yeah, yeah. People don't quite understand why do you do things to that in level of intellect for for little or no money what's the deal with that i think that's the hardest thing that people can't sure. understand people that are in their rooms like lab uh, professors tweaking a bass and, or a snare or a, you know some sub or something you know what i mean or finding the perfect sample or, or you know the, the right sample pack all of these things uh, just blow people's mind they're like well, well why how what's the deal why would you do a skateboard trick almost into yourself and and not get paid for it. What? It's like they can't get it. It's um, it's in your DNA, right? Mm. Do you know what I mean? Mm. I watched that Pixar movie Soul, mm. which had a beautiful message about we're all here. And this this is like, if I get on my spiritual side, which is grows more as, as I've got older. Mm. We're all here for a reason, and 
but only a few of us, I think, are lucky enough to find out what that is, and then mm. if you can do anything with it, if you find out why you're why you're here, you know, whether you're meant to be a musician or a doctor or a teacher or whatever it is, you know, everyone has a calling. Yeah. I believe. Yeah, for real. Do you know what I mean? And if you can find out what it is, and then make a little bit of money, enough money, so then you don't have to do a nine to five job. Mm. Like when I when I left school, I got an apprenticeship with a telecommunications company. I was still doing graffiti at the time because mm. mm. I, I had my accident in '88, so I would have been 17. I was two years left mm. school, and then I was just started DJing out at that time as well. But I complete. I did a four year apprenticeship. I mean, the last year was fucking hell because my last year was. My last year at college was um, day release on a Monday. Fucking Monday. Wow. So I was playing out at that time. So the, the last year I was there would have been 91, I think. And at that time I was playing out every weekend. And then you were having the Monday for that was it? No, Monday I had to go to fucking college. Oh, right. So the old fucking hell, man. And do like my fourth Whoa. year of telecommunications engineering. and man, you know, man. I don't even know how I got through it, yeah. you know, to be honest. But I knew, Shout out to the, all the workers, man, all the, all the proper grinders, you know. But I knew the third year, the third year when I had this apprenticeship, and I, that's when they kind of put you on work placements. They put yeah. you in different kind of departments, and you're working with these, you know, nine to five guys. I can remember being in this one place. It was like some computer design place where they're designing the chips for the, te- for the telecoms yeah. fucking... Yeah. Thing. I know the ones you mean. They got the crazy punches that they yeah. knock out these little bits out. Yeah, but I went yeah. into this place and everyone in there looked like they wanted to commit suicide. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was like, "Fuck, this is this yeah. is not for me. If I can, if I have the chance of not doing this, I'm gonna go for it, man. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah. when the rave scene came along, when I first started playing out and first started playing out at legal parties and then legal parties, I just went after. I, I chased that like, mm. put, you know, like yeah. no ends, but. I don't think I, I don't think I seriously thought there was a career in it until 93, 94 to that point. I was oh, still. Really? So you were saying that was just, just um, youthful wisdom. Yeah. I, I think when Goldie had the idea to kind of, when we felt like we'd outgrown reinforced and he had the idea of starting up a label, which was metalheads and the metalheads yeah, went yeah, on to yeah. become, you know, what it is. What is it? <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty <K-dang>. big. <laughs> He's pretty good, you know. He's got some potential that that metal edge, that. Yeah, <laughs> but at the time, man, you know, I think that's sort of when he, you know, when he when he set up that label and then started the Blue Note. I think Blue Note started in '94. Oh, mate, Blue Note was the one. Though. And um, <gasps> you know, and the first release was me and him, him on one side, me on the flip, zero zero one, which I'm wow. immensely proud of. How you many know, copies you got of them at your house? Three. Three. And one which is the Miss Press, which I think is worth a fucking ton of money. Yeah, man. I bet it is. Um, you hear that? Got a Miss Press <laughs> of the first ever. <laughs> um, and but that's when I kind of thought there's a there's a career here. Do you know mm, what I mean? Mm. There's there's once I once I saw once I saw it go abroad. Once I started mm. playing, going to Europe. Mm. Do you know what I mean? And then when obviously when the Blue Note took off and it exploded. Yeah. That kind of um, I think. The first year was kind of good, but 95 was just fucking nuts, man. Right. It was, you know. Well, you were just off, off, it was, off, off for the races. Yeah, it was, it was, it happened, it seemed to happen so quickly, man. Do you know what I mean? Because, mm. um, you know, the scene was super healthy in the mm. UK. You know, you had, I, I was playing at Laser Drum. Laser Drum was like probably my favourite club, 93, 94 in London, Peckham. That was, a, that was a wicked, that was an yeah. awesome place. And then I used to go to AWOL after that. I did a few guest spots there. I used to go See, to... these were all just tape pack dreams. Yeah, but I used, to go there to li- <laughs> I used to go there mostly to hear Randall, man, because Randall was the... Hold tight, Randall. Randall was the daddy back... You know, yeah. he's still the daddy now, man, but man. back then, man, he was so and, far ahead and of And Mampy as well, hold tight, Mampy yeah, Swift man. as well. There's loads of names, and I just could spring up that time, and then I'm thinking of tape packs and shit. And uh, <laughs> so then, yeah, Blue Note kind of, I think, started in 94. Mm. And then, but a year into it, man, it was fucking... Crazy man, I think I started going there in 97 98. It was, um, yeah, it was crazy, man. It, it, you know, it kind of went from this small thing. And I can remember Goldie when he said he was he wanted to start a club and do it on a Sunday. I was like, You're nuts, man, it'll never work. Mm, but it worked, yeah, it'll never work. And the first few weeks, man, you know, it wasn't, wasn't like an instant hit or anything, you know what I mean. And then I think people just kind of got that 
into their mindset of like a Sunday thing and they had a bit of food there as well early. Because it used to finish at midnight. I think it finished at half 12. Who came up with the name Metalheads? Thanks, G. I think he, but I think he kind of got it from Groove. Groove used to kind of refer to the dubs as metal because they were made of metal, acetate. And then he used to refer to people that cut dub plates as metalheads. And I think G took that as like, well, metalheads, stick a Z on the end, that'll do. So yeah, Groove's... But the groove, connotations groove. are mad because like, it, I mean, you know, for anybody like outside of the, the, the scene, particularly at that time, a metalhead was someone that was like a headbanger yeah, yeah, yeah. And, into their rock and roll, the, the yeah, fast you, type of rock and roll. you stick metalheads in, you know, hashtag into, um, into Instagram, yeah. Loads of metalheads things will come up and then loads of rockers will come up at the same time. But what it did was it reformulated an idea. It, it rebranded. It just made so much fucking sense at the time. Well, the thing, the, the, the thing was that that early era of metalheads, those first like Goldie was called the first 20 releases, like the, the Holy Grail. Like you can you can listen to those and then write any DMV tune you want. And big shout out, you know, uh, anniversary, 28 years, right? 25 years. 25 years. I, I think it's about 27. I think. But he's had a repress. Did he repress to the time? Oh, 25 cycle? years of timeless. Yeah, there yeah, you man. go. Boom. Which is like... Big shout out, Goldie and the time up. Yeah, and then that that era, um, if you look at those artists on, you know, you had Fotec, Dillinger, yeah. Lemon D, Hold tight, Fotec. Jay Magic, you know, just assassins. Yeah, 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 yeah. Do you know what I mean? And at that time, you know, I was kind of making music and I was just trying to hang with these fucking guys, you know what I mean? And, but it was a beautiful place to be, because I used to go, I used to go to Dillinger's, man, when he was living in South London and his studio was in, was in his mum's front room. Yeah. I remember the first time I went down there to get some, he was like, yeah, come down, man, I've got some tunes for you, I'll cut some dubs. I go down there and um, I go in, you know, just a normal house and the front room is these two giant tannoys. I can remember the first thing I saw, he was, he was mixing in down a tune. In his mum's living room? Mum's living room. Jeez, I thought my, st- <laughs> my, <laughs> yeah, my juice was taking a piss. This was like, this was like maybe Boy. 94, 95 or something. And I can, remember dis- I can remember distinctly, he was mixing down a tune. I can remember looking at the dat and the, the levels weren't moving. It was just brick, red line. I was like, what is going on here, man? But, this, but, he's, but it sounded incredible because Dillinger at that time was just... Insane, do you know he, what I mean? He, he, still a crushing in the sounds of Dillinger. Is that what makes? Yeah. Because okay, there was this there was this period of Dillinger that was just untouchable. King of the Beats, man. You know, still now. Yeah, yeah. Like, and uh, you listen, you, and you pull any of those tunes out from that kind of era, nothing sounds like that. And people can't even recreate they that. They can't sound recreate now. it. Yeah, you can't, can't recreate that sound now. Man. I don't know what I don't know what he was doing, man. To be honest. And I'm because I've never been that technical a guy when it comes to production. I'm I always kind of just you know I always say I'm a DJ that made some music. So when it came became a struggle for me to kind of make me, it was easy for me to. Gillinger was the complete opposite. I think he felt I felt like he was more the producer <sighs> than the DJ. He's in many respects. He I mean he had the formula. He had the Timberland equivocal with drummer bass. Very much so. Very much so, man. I mean, he made so many tunes, man, that he couldn't even remember them all. Do you know what I mean? And <laughs> <Just> bonkers. <laughs> And, you know, you'd ask him about a tune and he'd be like, oh, which one? I don't know. I think I might have recorded over the doubt. And you're like, what? What are you talking about? And he's like, no, I've got a better one for you. He's a man I want on a podcast without question. He's a savage man. You know, him and Lemon at uh, that time yeah. were just... Old tight Lemon deep. Yeah, they were savages, man. And that whole, that like I say, that whole era. And then you obviously you had the, the Bristol Boys, Ronnie, Die, Crust, yeah. and the whole full cycle yeah. sound. Shy effects, of course. Shy, shy. you know... Uh, you know, hype and mm. pa- it passed yeah, on yeah, zinc yeah. and the players, man. <sighs> that that like that you know that late nineties era was uh, mid to late nineties era was a savage fucking time for drum and bass, yeah, man. Yeah. And then obviously then you had you know you had Russian Optical were coming through zinc, and yeah. It was um Ganja Crew. It was a, I I get why people call it the golden era. It was ex- it was exciting, man. Do you know what I mean? And to be in the middle of it all was uh, it was a bit of a blur, but it was super exciting because every week mm. was just you know, you were hearing fucking few because um, my my thing is I'm always into stuff that sounds futuristic, yeah. man. Do you know what I mean? I, I like music that's got a, a futuristic edge to it. And just what drum and bass is at its best. That's that's when it's Floyd coming in, though, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, but but drum and bass like pushes it breaks the rules. It does yeah. things the wrong way. Like when Goldie made Terminator, he used yeah. a piece of equipment in the way it shouldn't be used. Yeah. You know, I've gone and mastered tunes and I've gone and cut dub plates when we weren't cutting if you we weren't cutting them at Music House got them at a regular place. And the engineer would be like, this is all wrong. 
oh, I can't, I can't cut this. He's like, I was like, no, trust me, that's how it's supposed Music to sound. Music House was the only place that really. You guys, I mean, I, I hear that side a lot. Music yeah. House was. Um, Music House was not just the place where we used to cut dubs. It was an educational place, a place where we all hung out, a place where we um, got to know each other really, really well outside of work. Do you know what I mean? Mm. And um, yeah, some legendary sessions mm. cut in there. And um, you know, I heard when, when Frost was saying, uh, it was funny because I chuckled when I heard him saying it, saying, yeah, you'd cut your things when, when the masses are around, but you'd hung around because you know you had some things you could only cut in front of a couple of people. Some real exclusive stuff. I can remember the first time he came in and he had Soul Emotion from Crust. I think it was Soul Emotion or maybe the last day. And he came in late. He came in late, it was like 11, 11 30. And he was like, Scotty, I've got a tune for you, man. I've got a tune for you. And he played Crust. I think it was the last day, actually. And he played this thing, man. And it sounded like something from 20 years in the future. Do you know what I mean? I was like, holy fuck. That's when you used to walk out with a dub plate. <sighs> And you felt its weight. You know what I mean? You were like, this is fucking special. This is going to destroy fucking metalheads on, on, on Sunday. Yeah, Do you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. I still get excited about like that now, but it's kind of different because it's digital and, you know, and there's much more music around. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I was going to say, because, you know, in a, in a cottage industry world now, particularly in, you know, we're out of lockdown temporarily, I'm pretty sure. But in this world of um, cottage, cottage industry and what metalheads was achieving... This is a double-ended, double question, actually, mm -hmm. or rather suggestion. Amusing, I understand. Because um, I've been thinking about this a while ago. I was like, yo, like, I think the next step in the cottage industry, b b beyond just having your own regular club night, is actually having your own night club. <laughs> and and then that way, you service, like, to have a metalhead's sh shop front, and inside you have all the, all the branding and USP of a metalhead's venue in the form of a go-to one-stop not only do i think that even works better now having metal heads as a night but also having it as a one-stop boutique place but but uh to have like a dub plate particularly back then and having that in an environment where you can just walk in and say ah well actually i've got this bad boy and you stick it in and you know the crowd is going to be receptive and bang up for it i think there's a time for that right now isn't there yeah i mean Music is always special, man. You know, there's good tunes are always, I mean, just driving down here, man. And that's what I've missed as well. Um, traveling, you know, traveling, touring is when I genuinely would be listening to music. And that's why this last year has been, it's been difficult for a lot of reasons. Do you know what I mean? Um, but I've just had to go out on my, on my bike sometimes. I'll just go for a drive just so I can mm. listen to music in a different environment. But just driving down here today was, was a joy because I had all these promos and to, to go through and was listening coming down there was like I've missed this man mm. do you know what I mean I've missed this kind of this is how I really kind of listen to music like when you're on a plane or you're on a train or whatever mm -hmm. kind of thing um, but just going back to yeah but those days getting dubs I can remember like when Groove Rider came in to to Bluno and he had Metropolis Adam F's Metropolis on dub plate mm. and, Adam F and at that at that time, me and, me and Groove used to pretty much play the last set in there for a couple, uh, you know, most of the time. And we had, we had a kind of friendly kind of rivalry kind of thing. It was a good thing, you, used to, you know, push Get the best other. out of those mixes, yeah. Yeah, and I can remember when he walked in and he had a smile on his face and I knew, I knew he had something special, <laughs> do you know what I mean? And that's, that's the thing, man. It, that's a real DJ kind of gets joy from that, do you know what I mean? Like, to this day, I get excited. When I get mm. sent something... And I know it's really, really good. I'm super excited to play it out at the weekend. Do you know what I mean? Or, mm. And that never, ever got... If the moment that goes away is the moment I think you need to move on. Do you know what I mean? You're making me want to go and listen to drum and bass right now. You know, like and... The whole idea of you battling for for energy. It wasn't even... It's like you say, it's healthy competition. Yeah, you're in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you're just, you're just rivaling. You're just going for it. And that's that B-boy shit again. It's, it's pure B-boy stuff, man. I mean, when I when we, when we I first got, started going to Rage, and especially when I started going with, um, with G, and we used to go down there quite mm. regularly, 92, 93, in there, in the crowd, would be the, the Moving Shadow Boys, the Bristol Boys, um, the Ibiza crew, you know, lots, lots of punters, but everyone in there, all, all, the, all the people that were making music, you know, all the yeah. labels and everything as well. 
So when then something got dropped, I can remember being in there and when a Ronnie, a Ronnie si early Ronnie size tune got dropped, and everyone would be looking around saying, who's this, who's this? And then Ronnie would be at the back going, yeah, this is my new tune. It works. Yeah. <laughs> Don't and those, sell. And those days, and that's kind of like what, what, when the Blue Note was at the peak of its powers, it was a similar thing. It was like Rage 2.0. You'd go there to be a and r in and getting but, a... But when the lights would come up at the end, there'd be all these DJs and producers all standing around the back. Like, oh, that's, and you hearing, know you're hearing, doing right. Hearing, what, hearing what's right. getting dropped because we had the, just, we had the, the freshest fucking sounds, man. Do you know what I mean? And it, the only way you, things get better is by listening to other stuff and learning. Mm. It's like, you know, similar to graffiti, man. Do you know what I mean? It's not biting, you just be, but you get inspired. Mm. You see someone that does like a sick kind of new arrow or a new burner or a new kind of throw up, a new bubble there. So I think that's why the kindred mm. spirits, man. Drum and bass, it's always evolving. It's like graph, man. It never mm. stays the same. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Or it shouldn't, or, or that's when you're in trouble. When I kind of fell out of love with drum and bass for a little bit in the 2000s, with it, because I felt it was just spinning its wheels a little bit. Mm. It wasn't, there were too many people just doing the same thing. Mm. And that didn't, that doesn't interest me, man. Do you know what I mean? Mm. I'm, a, I'm in, one of the beautiful things about drum and bass is the innovation part, people doing things you haven't heard before, mm. you know, which is obviously as time goes on, drum and bass is old now mm. it's coming up to being 30 years old from the original jungle tunes it's harder to do obviously but you still hear it i still hear tunes i'm like holy shit man how have they done mm. that or how have they fitted that into there into that into mm. there do you know what i mean so it's still exciting and that's what keeps me feeling young man and you know that's what that's what makes me want to keep DJ man and, and run a label and and play music. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. it, it's a, it's a, it's a passion and I love it, man. I love sharing music with people, man. And that's that's the fun. DJing just allowed me to to do that. Was was the medium that allowed me to do it? Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You know, from back in the day, from making mixtapes when I was like 12, 13 years old, staying up listening to John Peel to record two tunes from his show in the midst of all this crazy. <laughs> <laughs> mad indie band fucking stuff but he'd play like some crazy Detroit techno tune mm. like in the middle of his show and like record that stick it together splice it all together that's me Make for the week tape. done Doom. yeah yeah <laughs> or the month sometimes yeah yeah, yeah. those uh, glory days man glory days man I mean that's where I got my name from and I used to make these as mix in the doctor people used to say I used to take these mixtapes to school and then some kids would come to my house and then it'd be say, look, I would like it'd be like going to the doctors to, That's get, mad. to get a prescription. Really? So when I first started DJing out <laughs> in '88 at kind of these kind of like illegal like flat parties and kind of warehouse parties and stuff, at first I was going to DJ under my original graph name DJ D2, but I thought that sounded a bit naff. It didn't work. And then some, one of my friends said to me, "Said, like, why don't you call yourself Doctor Scott? Because people refer to you as Doc." I was like, "Okay." So on the early first flyers, early, early, early flyers. It actually says Dr. Scott. I, th I think, again, I didn't really like it. Mm. And then people just abbreviated it to Doc Scott, mm. which I thought had a bit more of a punch to it. And then it kind of just stuck from there, man. That's crazy. And that was the name. So the name was kind of, was given to me. Yeah. It's like a nickname from school. Yeah. And, um, again, it's just that, it's that, you, you, it was meant to be. It was meant to be, man. Written. You know, yeah, yeah, it's meant to be. It's, um, life's funny like that. Do you know what I mean? Just the way things go out. It's like the thing with Goldie and like meeting him, in the mid eighties mm. and then meeting him six years later. And then we had this, go on to have this beautiful friendship that we've had together and we've had ups and downs and, you know, life being life mm. kind of thing. But almost 30 years later, it's like my best friend in the scene. You know, someone that if I'm, if I'm got problems or if I've got trouble or if I just want to have a chat about nonsense, I can call up at three o'clock in the morning and have a, com you know, have mm -hmm. a chat about whatever. And that's a, it's a beautiful thing, and you know, you know, mm. you work in in this industry. Friends in this industry are hard to come by. Do you know what I mean? Because um, friendship takes time, and yeah, the yeah, industry yeah. the industry doesn't always have time. That's no, no, you know, and um, I had uh, you know, I'm doing this podcast with Frost on Sunday yeah. about mental health and not Frost on Sunday, you not Frost on Sunday, <laughs> yeah, Frost on Sunday, <laughs> Jumpy Jack Frost. Yeah, that's right, the Frost Report. Yeah, the Frost Report, and um. It's a mental health special, man, and, and it's about, um, you know, people like myself. I spoke about it publicly two or three years ago. I had some problems in the two thousands, 
And um, there's myself, Friction, MCGQ, mm. Mampy, and Frost. And we've all had problems at some points in time, you know what I mean? Mad, and I think yeah. it's a beautiful thing now that we can speak out about those mm. things publicly because like, even like 10 years ago, it was kind of difficult yeah. or you felt, didn't feel comfortable kind of speaking about those kind of things. Mm. But going back to the, the Goldie point, when I had my troubles and I turned, you know, and when I, when I hit rock bottom and things were really, really difficult, mm. I turned you know, I turned to my wife and I said like, I need fucking help. I can't, I've got things that I, I thought I could control and mm. I can't control them. She called Goldie. Goldie called me and he said, like, you know, are you serious about sorting yourself out? Because he knew I was on a bad run. You know, I'd fallen out of love with, I'd fallen out of love with drum and bass, basically, yeah. from about 2005 to 2009. Fell out of love See, with the that's music. that's the start of the, the when, you, when you lose your way, it normally starts with that sort of thing. Yeah, it? and I'd fallen out of love with the kind of, you know, I'd had this, like, amazing run through the 90s. The 90s was just fucking amazing. Yeah. You know, it was, like, insane. Yeah. And I'd gone from this punk ass kid that had nothing to the end of the decade, Having fucking, to, you know, going everywhere, touring, yeah. doing everything. Do you know what I mean? And it was just too fast, man. Everything happened too fast. And I didn't have anyone to look up to, to ask for advice. Because no one tells you about going from nobody knows you to being known in different countries, mm. right? Nobody, know, nobody tells you about um, earning 40 quid a gig to them being able to earn a, a really good living. And you know what I mean? Because all of us that were in drum and bass um, before the mid-90s, man, we, we all came from similar backgrounds. Um, and all of a sudden we started earning decent money. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And the 90s being the 90s, man, there were lots of temptations around, lots mm. of this, that, and the other. Mm. And I got I remember getting to the early 2000s, man, and I was just burnt out. I was burnt out with everything. I remember doing this ridiculous tour schedule in I think 2002 2003 where I was away for like nine or ten weeks and I went to Japan Australia New Zealand South America America the four-week tour of America with Goldie and after that I said to him I'm never touring with you again I love you G never touring with you again it was just too much too much debauchery too much everything really we I tell you I tell you a funny story the third week into I the, love a funny story. Third week into this <laughs> tour, it was me, Goldie, and uh, MC Rage, Pat, who now MCs for yeah, yeah, Chase and Status. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this thing got so bad um, that we didn't speak to each other for, I think, three days. But it was so juvenile as well. What was it? Someone took your record or something? <laughs> we just, I don't know, this tour life, man. You know what I mean? You've been on tour. Yeah. and like I've heard you speaking about being on tour mm. and... The van, it, it, it amplifies, it makes things bigger than it is and the planes are just as bad as well. We're, we're, we just, it was just too much. I, this was like the end of like, I'd been away for like about six weeks and then stupid, I kind of said yes to this tour of the States. Excuse me. And I think we did um, 24 dates in 28 days. Oh, that's some Bowie shit. Whoa. Yeah, it was like crazy, oh, yeah. man. So the third week into this thing, we were like frazzled, man. Do you know what I mean? And I was yeah, like, yeah. I was at the end of my tether. You can't do that every night, can you? And uh, yeah, it all came to a head, man. We, there was, we did this gig in San Francisco. And funnily enough, man, we played after the Black Eyed Peas. This is obviously before the Black Eyed Peas had blown up. And Goldie got into a fight with a drummer from the Black Eyed Peas on stage in front of like a fucking thing. It was, it was so, it, so many things happened on this tour. <laughs> So, we, so I want more things that happen on the street. Don't, don't think we're stopping here. Carry on. So <laughs> the, I remember the security kind of grabbed us and kind of shoved us on these golf buggies and got us out of there. And we got up to the hotel and I was like, gee, man, listen, I'm done, man. I, I, I've got to get home. I'm, you know. So he was like, yeah, cool, man. Like, if you want to go home, I'll, I'll finish off the tour. And um, he'll probably tell you it differently. He'll probably tell you a different version of the story, but this is what happened. So I remember I was in my room and I was, I was on, I was on, the phone to British Airways, I was, I was, we was in San Francisco. I was like, okay, I, I want to fly. I need to get home, man. Do mm. you know what I mean? We had another week to do, we had like another six dates. Mm. I, I thought, I can't face it. I need to get home. I've had enough. I've mm. had enough of being away from home. Mm. So he comes in, cold, he comes into my room and he's like, what are you doing? I said, I'm getting a flight home. He's like, are you going to leave me? So I've got to do the rest of the tour. I goes, what the fuck are you talking about, man? He goes, you just told me if you're, if you're done, man, like go home, you know, get a flight home. I was like, what are you talking about, man? He was like, I can't fucking believe you're going to leave me on this tour, blah, 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 blah. I was like, don't fucking talk to me, man. So like, 
stupid, like 14 year old kids. We didn't speak to each other for about three days. And then poor Pat, MC Rage, <laughs> which we like literally kind of saying to him, tell Goldie, I'm going to get some breakfast and then I'll see him at the gate. And this is how it was for like really stupid Damn. shit. And then, but in a loving way, but we just had enough of each other. Mm. You know what I mean? And then I remember we were doing this like, Weird gig in San Antonio in Texas. So this was after San Fran. Carried on. Yeah, yeah, no, because I was oh, like, okay, I was, like, I was okay. like, no, I was like, okay, cool, I'll, I'll, I'll see it out. But I was like, don't, you know, don't, don't fucking speak to me. Let's not, and then we can't get in on each other's nerves or whatever. It's so, so silly. And then in San Antonio, <laughs> I've been there by the way. I know I got, exactly what you're going. I got <laughs> really, really drunk. I think we all got really drunk. I got so drunk, man, that I got on the mic, and that's the only time I've ever been on the mic in my life. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I still fret about it to this day because I'm sure Goldie's got a tape of it somewhere. He says there was no recording, but I'm sure he's holding it as some kind of ultimate blackmail card that he can pull out. <laughs> so you want a fucking dub. <laughs> um, yeah. And then, but yeah, we just kind of all broke down and cried and hugged each other and whatever. But Too close of friends, man. Yeah. But, you know, and then, but, but the, going back to the point, that was the beginning of feeling burnt out with it all. And then through that period in the 2000s, I mean, there were, it wasn't all bad, but I'd kind of, kind of just run out of steam and was falling out of love with the music. I felt the music wasn't going anywhere. Mm. And then the thing is, you know, from you know, if you, when you're on the road, when you're touring, or even if you're just doing a gig in the UK, if I'm driving from the Midlands to London, mm. if you're not enjoying that time when you're on the decks, you know, if you're not enjoying that period, that that hour, how's it going to resonate? A that that as well, people can tell. Yeah, but also. The, then it really becomes a grind. Do you know what I mean? Catching flights, being away from home, hotels, all that, all that stuff yeah, 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 yeah. is really horrible. Because if you don't, it, because at the end of the day, you know, you don't want to sound like a like pretentious man. Touring can be hard, man, but it's not the hardest thing in the world. But the but the but the beautiful thing is the time when you're on stage, when you're on the decks, That's when you're on the mic, yeah. whatever it is you're doing, it all, then it's all worthwhile. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? The, the, the six hour layover, the four hour drive, the, 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 the Dodger hotel, whatever, yeah, whatever yeah. it is, it's worthwhile. When you don't have that moment at the end of it, when you get off the decks and you go, well, I still feel like shit. That's when you go back to your hotel and you do things you shouldn't be doing. Yeah. And, and that's when it all just becomes nasty, man. Do you mm -hmm. know what I mean? But then you're kind of in this position where it's like, well, this is what I do for a living now. Mm. It's like I can go and do something else. I can't take six months off. So I was kind of trapped in this cycle of like, I was still getting a lot of work, still getting booked. But I, for the most part, I wasn't enjoying it, man. Do you know what I mean? Mm. And it was a rough period from about 05 to 09. It was just a slow decline into kind of self. I ended up kind of suicidal, basically. Do you know what I mean? Because it's just self. Because then you start to think to yourself, you've got the best gig and you've got the best job in the world. Mm. Why are you feeling like this? And then you beat yourself up about that. And then, mm. you know, the whole thing goes to like a level of, it sounds dramatic, but it is. It's like a level of PTSD when you come off of something. So the ride's really high. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and when you, when you, you know, I know, I know people that do what I do for a living and they can phone it in. They phone it in really, really well. And I don't mean that in any, any disrespect. Mm. They, they are professionals. You know, they can go out there and be professional and they do a professional job and they sound great. But I love what I do, man. I, I really, really love it, man. I love the music. I love everyone in the scene. Mm. I love DJing. I love representing drum and bass. So when I wasn't loving it, it really hurt. Mm. You know what I mean? It really, really hurt me to the point where I hated myself for it. You know what I mean? I, I, I've hated myself that I was going out there and getting paid and I knew I wasn't enjoying it, man. Do you know what I mean? Mm. So it's like this whole downward spiral and then it all kind of just imploded in 2009 where I kind of had a breakdown and a meltdown. Mm -hmm. I got a DUI in 2008 and just, yeah, it was really bad, man. Like wow. I was kind of, and I just had a kid up. My, my son was born in 2003 and I was struggling to deal with that. And then it was, it, it was just horrible, mm -hmm. you know, for, for everyone that was around me, it was horrible for myself. It was just like this black hole of kind mm -hmm. of negativity. And it hit rock bottom. And I, you know, I turned around to my wife and just broke down. I was like, I need fucking help, man. Mm -hmm. I can't stop this self-destructive behavior that, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? And you know, that's when Goldie kind of used to like, are you serious about sorting yourself out? Mm -hmm. And I was like, yeah, I've got to, man, because otherwise I don't know where this ends. I don't want, you know what I mean? This, this, this might only end in one place. Uh, and 
a real, not a nice don't place. Don't want to be there. Yeah, yeah. So he's like, okay, I'm going to put you in touch with these people called Hoffman, Hoffman Institute. And he'd done it because he kind of went through the mill in the mid 2000s and he'd done it like about four years before, I think. Mm. He said, if you're serious about sorting yourself, sorting your shit out, and you had to get yourself clean and get yourself off everything before you could, and then they kind of vet you have to do this interview to kind of go there. And you can't, you can't really talk about what goes on there. It's, um, but basically, I went there in 2010, April, it was literally just past the anniversary, 11th anniversary. And you go there for a week and you take your phone off you and you're locked away and you're there with like 14 other people that have got fucking problems mm. and issues and whatever. And basically, without basically you, you come out i came out of there reborn like they break you down they take you back to your childhood and they get to the root of whatever the cause of the problem the problem was that i wasn't burnt out the problem was that i wasn't there were other issues that i just never addressed in my life do you know what i mean well, as a youngster as a youngster you know what i mean and they were just resurfacing now in a different kind of form yeah. in a different way and as an adult i just couldn't de couldn't deal with them kind of thing mm. do you know what i mean and without getting too kumbaya-ish, but I come out of there a different person, man. It's it, I couldn't... If you'd have told me before, because I'm very sceptical about any of these kind of things, man, mm. do you know what I mean? Um, but I come out of there and I experience things when I was there and I learn about the things that were making me really unhappy. I mean, yeah, yeah, touring was making me unhappy. Not being in love with the scene was making me unhappy. You know, that, those were valid things, but there were other things that were much more of a core issue. Mm. And once you got to the core, once it got to the core, everything else kind of fell into place. So, I, you know, I always break down my life into decades because I was born in 1971. So I'm a kid, in the I grew up in the 70s. Mm. I was a teenager in the 80s and the 80s, what, what it was. Mm -hmm. I became famous in the 90s. You know, I made, my, I made myself as a DJ in the 90s. I lost the plot in the 2000s. And then the last decade, the 2010s, was about rebuilding and redemption. And it was about, can I, first of all, can I just get my life back on track? Mm -hmm. Thankfully, I did. Then it was like, can I, can I rebuild and resurrect my career to back where it should be? Because I'd lost myself as a as a DJ. Do you know what I mean? I think a lot of people can resonate with this hard. Yeah, you know, and I because and I'd I'd, I'd I'd lost the reason why, why am I even de why am I even here? Mm -hmm. So I can remember sometimes being on stage and why am I even here? Yeah. Because because the thing was, I became the thing that I'd loathed about other people was I'm just here for the money, I'm just here picking up a wage, you know what I mean? And that's what I despised in other in other DJs. Not on a personal level, just because like I'm just some kind of purist or something, and but I'd become that person, you know what I mean? So I, that's why I really, really hated myself. The genre, the genre. Now, actually, I can't even call it for drum and bass because as a fan of it, I never saw it probably the way that you guys from living inside the bubble. But there are comparables like punk imploded, yeah, hair metal, heavy metal imploded, um, and. Elements of hip hop imploded. Every scene needs a reset. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Every, every now and then. Do you know what I mean? Every, every, everything goes through yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. And the the thing that was kind of just difficult for me personally was we were, I say we, the collective we, the DJs that I came up with, your Fabios, your Groove Riders, your Mickey Finns, mm -hmm. your Randalls, mm -hmm. they were, all those guys were older than me for a start. I was the youngest of my generation, if you like. Mm -hmm. And there was there no one that there was no one that had done it before, you know what I mean. So there's no one that I could go to for advice. I mean, there was when we yeah. started kind of when the scene kind of got bigger and became international and whatever. There was no one that I could speak to yeah. because we were all doing it for the first time. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So the mistakes. Now, now I can pass on my advice to other people because I've made those mistakes. Do you know what I mean? Sometimes I'll say to people, just. Just be careful. Save a bit of your money. Just be careful. Mm. Try and play the long game. You know, because you never know how long this is gonna is gonna mm. last, man. Because fame's a weird thing, man. Yeah, man. And you know what? You hit the nail on it. The amount of conversations I have with people, you know, like it's hard. It's hard because I know a demographic of my audience, of all walks of life and different age groups. But one thing I will say in 
what you're saying, and I can reiterate it as a generation below you mm-hmm. or so, is, is you, you, when you're high, you're fucking high. Um, you think this money's going to come in forever and ever and ever, and you don't know why, but it's just something in you that you can just walk on a stage and kill it and everyone loves it. And, the, 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 you know, it's, it's, it's the, the uh, you know, it's, it's that, uh, it's the zeitgeist that everyone thinks that only they hold for themselves. And then when you suddenly hit the ground, you think, so, oh, actually, wait a minute. What did I do with all that stuff I had? What did I do with all that? Yeah. You know what? I wish I had, you know, there's all these. I think the thing was as well, man, like from playing out in like 89, 90, everything had been an upwards trajectory. Do you know Mm. what I mean? All through the 90s was just. So natural. A glorious, Mm. you know, everything was just, you know, so the first time I kind of hit a pothole, I just didn't know what to do. Do you know what I mean? I didn't know what to do and I didn't know who to turn to. Mm. You know what I mean? And And like I say, at that time, speaking about mental health, even like even in the mid 2000s it was a little bit taboo man i mean it's, it's still taboo today to some people but in the mid 2000s to say i'm not happy and i don't know i don't know why do you know what i mean like when i actually saw some professionals they said you're you're clinically depressed you know what i mean you're you you're suffering from depression mm. you know self harming at the time kind of just doing anything to kind of mask the to to mask the get away from the issues that I just couldn't face or couldn't figure out what was going on. Do you know what I mean? But the last decade, coming out of the Hoffman 2010 and then falling back in love with music again, finding myself, finding that inner child. and Thank God, eh? Thank God, man. And That you feeling know, of thank God I got through that and I'm liking this again. This, <laughs> the, the last like, I mean, the last 10 years, the, the last, that whole decade, like I said, I... I put my life into decades of chapters. And then this 2010 to 2020 of rebuild and redemption is the is the most beautiful feeling, man. But I can remember doing a festival with Randall a couple of years ago, we did SW4 mm. for Chase and Status. And we and him were doing back to back. It was like fucking 15, 20,000 people, Sunday afternoon. And when you're doing a back-to-back set, that's sometimes when, when you're playing, sometimes you can't really take it in. Mm. When you're doing a back-to-back set, that's when sometimes you just take a step back, Randall's playing these three tunes or whatever we're doing, and you just stop back and you go, I'm back, mm. I made it, I got back, man. And it's like, it was a beautiful <laughs> feeling, man, do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know what it's like, when you get older, you see things wider in a mm. wider vision, you know what I mean? Like the, the screen becomes mm. wider. Mm. You can take it in more. You can appreciate it more. And when you like, I know it sounds so cliche, but when you've nearly lost everything mm. and you get it back, it's yeah. such a sweet feeling. Like I, I appreciate. It's much more every, precious now, isn't it? It's so yeah. precious, man. I appreciate every moment. Mm. I appreciate every nice comment. Mm. I appreciate every tune that's sent to me. Mm. I appreciate every moment I wake up. I'm with dude. you, bro. Like this whole podcast thing. You know, it's the same thing. And being able to speak about these things publicly. Like when I did this interview and I first spoke about the problem, the issues that I had, I did an interview with UKF about two years ago, I think. And that was the first time I really spoke publicly about it. First time I really spoke, felt comfortable speaking mm-hmm, publicly mm-hmm. about it. Cause I was so far removed from it mm. kind of thing. Um, and then the guy that I did the interview with, they, they hit me up and said like, this is the most read and shared article we've had on UKF this year. And I think it's done some good. And the beautiful thing was I had people hit me up in the scene that had been through similar things, but I'd never spoken about it. Wow. And they said, thank you for doing that. I thought it was just me. Mm. And then people that I kind of knew, but don't really know, sent me messages. And people that I'd never met in my life said, thank you for saying those things. And that's that's the thing with it, you know, Frost, God bless him, man, doing this thing on Sunday with, you know, those people that I mentioned. The more you speak about these things, Hopefully, the the less t- t- well, I don't think it's that taboo anyway. Thankfully, mm. and the less people hopefully can get into trouble because you know, like suicide in males is like brutal, man. Like the yeah. numbers are savage, man. You know, you know, as as you were talking, there was a couple of things that stuck out. Um, it is taboo. It's taboo in music. It's taboo because I feel like sometimes what you need at the end of every ride, particularly with the with the fame side of you know, like Nicky Graham, a uh, close friend of. Mine, he was a big brother. Well, a close friend of my girlfriend's, I'll say. I'm not, you know, 
an acquaintance of mine, good mm-hmm. friend of, of this household. She passed away recently through anorexia. Yeah, I saw that. You know, and that was, th- you know, through lack of mm-hmm. attention. And you can source back to the, the doctors and the nurses for letting her go, et cetera, et cetera, and all the different things that have been exposed in the, the weeks that have just gone by. But the truth is, you know, b- the, the, the the TV networks need to hold themselves from root accountable. Yeah. I also feel like in the music world, it's the same sort of thing. Um, two names that spring to mind is is Wiley and Kurt Cobain. Right. I think drum and bass is very lucky in that, I would argue, you've all retained your icons. Sure. When Wiley's a different kettle of fish, I feel like, the impact of what happened with him, even though he's doing his thing now under the radar and he's still the same guy, the impact of having an icon being removed from the equation. Sure. And similarly to Kurt Cobain, more so from a, from a um, place of, you know, of depression and uh, over drug use, he's gone. And what happened to that scene? Dispersed. I, th- I feel like there's so much a lot of deep levels in in depression and um where it arises from and what happens and the results of to a scene i think sure. it's yeah I, I think the thing that it's been beautiful as we've got older and drum and bass has got older and it's matured as right. a scene like and like you say like the some of the people at the i say at the top there's not like a tree but you know what i mean like the elder the elder guys yeah. or whatever um it, you know you know you get older and you mellow yeah. a little bit and we lost, as a scene, we lost like two or three people passed away through natural causes mm. in, a, in a three, four year period. And it really, really brought the scene together. It was, it was a beautiful thing out of something when we lost like a couple of really iconic DJ producers. Um, it really brought the scene together. And not, not that this, it's not like the old days. I mean, the, the, there was kind of like rivalry, but not never in a kind of bit, bitter way. It was like mm. just competitive rivalry mm. between certain labels and camps and mm. and clubs or whatever. Do you know what I mean? Mm. But the the drum and bass scene now is so strong and unified. It's yeah. a it's a beautiful thing, man. And like, and like I say, it's beautiful as well because n- nobody owns it, man. It's just this entity that mm. exists. You see those lineups, boy. You know those I mean? lineups are insane at the moment. Yeah, man. And they're, they're like, like coming. Okay, we're gonna just do uh, Raven Fields. Let's go August. It's like crazy. Yeah, I mean, you got like um, Kings of the Rollers. They yeah. just announced they're doing a gig. They're doing print works yeah, in yeah. November. And um, voltage, you're in Blade Runner, hold tight, you killing got it, Inja, you know, hold tight. That next generation guy, Crazy. you know what I mean? Smashing it, man. And so they announced, I think they announced, what day is it today? Thursday. Mm. They announced Tuesday, I think they announced the lineup. And God bless them. Thank you guys. Mm. I'm on that thing doing back to back with Randall and yeah, Spy. I see, I see you. <laughs> and, uh, and they sold out in 24 hours. Print works. <sighs> Bonkers. So this is one, so going back to what we were talking about earlier. So I, I mean, they don't really say it now, actually. It hasn't been said for a long time. But, you know, when you see people go, oh, are you still doing that drum and bass thing? Is that still popular? I'm like, you don't know, man. You don't know. Drum and bass is, she's a, you know, it's so big. Because it, it's, you know, it's, it has an energy it's that always ridiculous. appeals to... It's bonkers when people... I know what you mean. I think it's because it's its, its own ecosystem. Well, that's what I'm saying. Because it doesn't, it doesn't need... It doesn't need your mixed mags of the world to do an article to say, oh, we're still relevant. Yeah. It's like, you can write about us or don't write about yeah, us. Yeah. It doesn't really make any difference. It doesn't need Birmingham NEC. It, it, it just needs a place. It needs, a, it, it, it needs an environment. It's so healthy, man. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's crazy. Like, before, before COVID, you know, you can go to London any weekend, man, yeah. and find three places where it's popping off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you know what I mean? That's the best, man. And, um, and then on a global tip, man, you know, yeah. You can go anywhere in the world, man. And drum and bass, like, is it's uh, it's huge, man. It's a beautiful thing, man. I, I'm I'm proud to represent it. I'm proud to be part of it, man. Do you know what I mean? Mm. And always have been, man. Um, mm. just, and a pioneer. Well, a fucking that's, OG. You know what I mean? You know, my my one of my biggest drives has always kind of been um, just to be relevant. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Is to always try and is to always be relevant in some way, shape, or form. So when people say nice things like that, it's very nice. But I'm I'm not one to kind of look back and just rest on anything that I've done in the past. Do you know what I mean? It's about what's happening tomorrow, and that's why I'm always excited with these 
the new guys coming through. I'm always looking for the next, as someone that runs a label, but I'm, I'm always interested in the new guys coming through, the new, the next generation. This is custom drum and bass, it's a generational thing. Mm. And um helps keep you young. I mean, I'm 50 next month when this goes out. Probably a couple of weeks. Serves you right. Happy birthday. And, um, thank you, man. And I can't believe that I'm... 50 years old. I can't, yeah. you know, but it helps me to stay great. young, man. Because yeah, it's yeah, such yeah. a... There's such an energy to it. Do you know what I mean? It's like graffiti as well. Mm. You see some of the... You know, you bump into some of these riots, man, and they're like in their 50s, mm. man. Do you know what I mean? But they're 50 oh. going on 25, man. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, oh, there's... It's the fountain of youth. Music, creative arts, culture... You know, you know. I think it's a, it's a, it's a beautiful time to be alive, and the, you know, the whole COVID thing, it's given us time to kind of really appreciate what's mm. important, and what isn't, and fingers crossed. You know, the UK is we're on the cusp of opening up, man. I'm like, I'm excited. I'm, I'm cautious, but I'm excited. Wow. Can't you know, wait. I'm excited. I'm excited to get out there, man. Get back it's out. Kind there. of the future, ain't it? It is, man. Getting back out there and doing it. <laughs> yeah, mate. It's been a fucking pleasure. Thank you, man. Thank you very much. You know how to do a fucking chat, boy. Uh, come on, Mr. Shy. Come yeah, on. Uh, what? <laughs> uh, nah, thank you, man. It's been, a little, it. it's been a little bit surreal. Yeah. You know what I mean? But good in a good way. It's you know been what I mean? Fucking fantastic. Thank you, man. I'm so glad you fast through. And big shout out to everybody who made it happen. Jeez. Yeah, shout out to Reese, Navi, yeah. G, Frost, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Drax, Drax, Goldie. Yeah. Yeah, man. This is your family. This is my family. Thank you very much. Worlds are interconnected, man. Right. Always. And more, more of that, please. Thank you very much, yeah. man. The dog man. Big shout. The dog's got inside the place. And yeah, without question, that's been your podcast for this week. All right. Hold tight. Big shout to everybody. Don't forget sharing is caring and all that business. All right. Metalheads crew, you know what we do. All right. You stay lucky, people. Don't talk to any strange ones. All right. Easy. That was good. 